First of all, uh, my name is J.R. Logan. I'm the executive director of Make Haven, and I've been uh, excited to bring this community bio initiative to our makerspace. Uh, for me, this uh, experience uh, really got started at the beginning of our makerspace as we are looking at what is the wide variety of things that we could do. Uh, and that included uh, bio. I was interested in watching YouTube videos and so on. Uh, this became more real for me as I was able to participate in something called the Community Bio Summit. Uh, this is a group that uh, brought people together who are working in uh, various maker spaces that are, um, you know, potentially entirely focused on bio, or it could be a, a combination of things. But the shared principle is to bring science to the general public, uh, to bring the DIY, the maker spirit to biology, and to help people to understand this, um, these tools and this way that nature works in order that they can be informed as citizens, uh, as entrepreneurs, as uh, people who just enjoy learning. And so I'm, I'm excited to be ushering in the, uh, the efforts here at Make Haven as a specific initiative. Really it's composed of a few parts. So we have a, a dedicated room that is going to have uh, capabilities for teaching and learning, uh, much like you might have in a lab, but uh, made appropriate for the type of space that we have. Uh, we, you might have seen a community garden that Lior built in the uh, back, so I consider that part of it. We have a strong brewing community, and we have the uh, brewing machine, and the, the group around there, so I'm looking for interaction. And then you can think of uh, cooking and culinary as being a part of how all these pieces work together. Uh, so we're looking at this uh, broadly. Oh, and, and one last one is uh, machine building. So a really exciting uh, capability that comes with having the full makerspace with the metalworking shop and 3D printers and everything else uh, connected to the bio initiative is that we can build machines or improve and enhance machines. And I'm excited about the types of innovation that will, will come out of that. So there's, there's many prongs. Uh, in particular, I think our focus is this room where we are going to uh, be talking about new capabilities. So in order to bring us into the conversation, I thought it would be really useful for us to have some uh, external expertise. Someone who has uh, been involved with this uh, movement has operated a, uh, a lab at a higher level and uh, engaged with others across the country and can provide insights. So uh, Maria is here. Uh, Maria, would you um, introduce yourself and, and share your um, perspective on what community uh, bio is and what labs can do? I sure can. Um, and I was going to um, ask, do you guys want like a slideshow presentation or an informal talk? Because I can do either. Because I, I am happy to have you do some slides okay let me uh enable that for you thank you um uh i do give this talk a lot i um just found out i was doing this uh just a short while ago so you guys are going to get a slide deck i prepared for a group i gave um to the latin american interdevelopment bank so this was to um this was a shortened version of a talk i gave to policymakers throughout latin america who work for things like the Department of Agriculture or Office Ministry of Technology for the 26 countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. And what we were discussing with them in the UN was um, how biomaking and community labs can be a really important part of their bioeconomy and their actual plans. And I think this is as true for um, local economies in the US as it is internationally. So, um, if there's a little bit of an international focus on this talk, that would be why, though. So let's get this going. Screen share look OK? It looks great. Great. Thank you, guys. All right. So uh, I'm happy to talk with you guys. Um, I love talking about this topic. I do it a lot. Uh, but first off, people always ask, why do I talk about this? So who am I? 
So um, I probably have what can either be atypical or very typical of community labs, the traditional, non-traditional sort of background. So I've actually got my degree in programming and operating systems. I have an MBA in global management. Um, I spent several years working as a machinist, so I am very comfortable around maker spaces and machining equipment. Um, I've worked at Apple. I've worked um, as a Unix administrator. I then got into biotech doing grant writing and marketing. Um, and that's where I really got interested in this thing called community labs. So I joined BioCurious as a volunteer when they opened in 2011. Um, I'm now the current president. I've been involved with BioSummit, which we'll talk about since as one of the core organizing team um, since 1.0 through 4.0 including running our fellows program. Um, I lead a lot of community projects that we'll be talking about. Um, and in addition to that, I'm a board member of a uh, foundation called the Momental Foundation that pairs startup companies with postdocs. And when people ask me, why do I do so much? It's because I uh, am kind of a full-time volunteer because I'm also a stay-at-home mom who homeschools. And my goal is really to try to figure out how can we make the better, wor better world for my kids and everybody else's kids. So let's talk a little bit about this crazy thing called the bioeconomy and why is biotech important? So when we talk about biotech, a lot of times and the idea of bioeconomy, we talked about only two things, the first two things on this list. And the idea that biotech was really pharmaceutical development, a standard path to drug development or towards therapeutics or it's in institutions like um, universities and it's research to understand the fundamentals of biology or ecology um, or genetics. But what we've been seeing over the last 10 years is a real shift and especially in the last two years where biology is technology. So that means that we're now seeing a new wave of uh, several companies now that are working to encode data in DNA. So this would take data out of silicone and actually put data into a DNA format because it's much more compact and much longer term storage. There's also a lot of work being done is data as a potential biological computer. We're seeing a large shift begin um, as uh, this new type fermentation technology is taking off um, as a way to combat climate change and deal with sustainability and that's biotech is factory. So what this means is anything from lab-grown leathers, um, lab-grown meats, um, new ways to make dyes that are not sustainable and not uh, requiring um, uh, toxic sort of um, ways to create what we're doing, fragrances, et cetera. Um, and this bio as factory is really, really gonna change a lot of economic landscapes, especially globally. Um, and there's a lot of industry disruption that's gonna happen and it will change um, what's going to be going on in the global landscape and it's already starting to see these large shifts um, begin to happen and this is one of the reason things like the Chinese are very interested in this sort of technology. Um, but another arm of this is DIY bio which is this idea is bio is home innovation, democratizing science, getting the home consumer more involved in biology through the use of com uh, uh, community labs um, and that's what I want to talk a little bit more about today. Maria, if when I made you host, it seems like it's not showing me people who want in. Would you mind just checking participants, see if anybody's queued? Apologies. We do have a couple of folks queued. Hold on. I think I got to leave the presentation to get to them. And let me go ahead and make sure you give me just a second. Um, participants. So let's see. You are what's, what's your screenshot name? I can't see it right now. Yeah, it's Make Haven. I just reclaimed it so I can okay. add people, hopefully. Oh, yeah. and it's a lot to share, so we're yeah, good. As long as you're host, I can just be a co-host. Great. Yeah. yeah. Continue. Sorry for the no interruption. No worries, no worries. Um, I just want to talk just a little briefly again, just um, this idea of the new protein landscape is the biggest thing people are thinking of. So um, two years ago, there was about a dozen companies on this list. And these are companies involved in um, new protein, whether it is uh, the Impossible Burger, uh, Beyond Burger, all of these companies that are around to support them. 
and all of the different companies and infrastructure that are needed. So this is kind of a map of the new protein landscape that's been put out. Um, the new one will come out in a month or two. Um, and this map has doubled or tripled every year for the last several years. So this market, at least as far as investment goes, is very, very large and just continuing to grow. Um, and especially overseas, the uh, Singapore market in particular is investing heavily in these technologies. Um, and people are just interested. They want to find out, is there more sustainable ways for us to get the foods we like and other things we like, other than just turning to animals, other than just cutting down the rainforest, whatever else you're looking at. But that takes us back. So if you want to get this innovation, if you're interested in science, what do you do? This is the same problem we see in maker spaces. What do you do if you need a large tool and you don't have room in an apartment? Um, in our case, you need a lab. Um, the way the BioCurious was founded is Ari Gentry, our founder, needed a lab space. She was doing a cancer research startup. Um, lab benches at that time in 2008 in the Bay Area were running $6,000 a month. Or no, sorry, $3,000 a month for six feet of bench space. So one lab bench that's about six feet long, $3,000 a month. She couldn't afford it. So this is a screenshot of her garage where she got some used lab equipment as you do in the Bay Area and just did her startup out of her garage. Um, but what came out of that is she said, you know, we can reuse this equipment and actually think about making a community lab. So we raised about $35,000 to kickstart us off of Kickstarter. We opened the doors in September, 2011. Um, we have 95 active members, seven active community projects. We're 6,700 square foot space. Um, and we are one of the largest community labs in the world. Uh, I think we're second only to BioRiddle in Mumbai. So what are we? Um, we want to make innovations in bio affordable and accessible. So we're scientists, entrepreneurs, citizens. We're entirely volunteer run like a lot of makerspaces are. Our, our costs are covered through membership classes, events, and donations. Um, and we really want to provide a space for entrepreneurs, students, anybody to safely um, but affordably um, get access to lab space. Um, we want to democratize, and that's a word we use a lot, the access to biotech, because right now, if you want to do a lot of these biotech experiments, you really have to deal with an institution. There's not very many biotech incubator spaces. Um, you know, six months ago, Boston was 100% out of biotech in incubator space. There was no more lab bench space. It's a problem we have in the Bay Area and a lot of places. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of universities, if you're a student, there's no way for you to actually get in the lab and just experiment um, outside of class. Um, by doing this, we give startups a really low cost to reach proof of concept, which gives them more success. Um, our current facilities includes labs, classroom space, as well as uh, many offices for the startup companies. We do have on-site biosafety level one tissue culture room, which is unusual for a community lab. Um, and we're located right smack in the very center of Silicon uh, Valley. Our basic business model look pretty familiar to you guys. We charge $100 a month for basic membership. Um, and then there's a lot of additional fees. So if you want to use that tissue culture room, you are charged an extra $75 a month. Um, if you want access to the minus 80 freezer, we charge you an extra 20 a month because um, the minus 80 freezer in utility costs runs us about $200 a month for just the electrical costs for the minus 80. Um, we teach a lot of classes for teenagers through adults. We do technical briefings um, and we have a lot of community projects. Members learn through classes. Um, the classes are very ad hoc. So when we have people available to teach them, they do. We do have some members who um, do cost splitting on uh, classes. So that means that they take 50% of the profits for teaching a class. Um, but we also have a lot of classes where people volunteer their time. And this is just a sample list of the kind of things we do for the startups. We do things like intellectual property basics. We have a very large set of teens teaching teens lab skills classes. So this is like really basic things like how to pipette and how to do gel electrophoresis or how to use the qpcr machines or pcr machines um and more our most popular series has actually been our mammalian um cell culturing class because that's something a lot of people never got to do in college uh and we're really interested in working with 
mammalian cell lines. Um, and because it's a premium class with very expensive materials, um, we do charge a lot more for that class. Safety is the biggest question when doing community spaces like this. We have a safety group. All of our members have to pass an online safety training uh, before they go in the lab. The number one thing we do and the number one thing I tell people if they're interested in this is um, all the experiments that are done in our space are reviewed. So we have a safety form that they have to submit. And we have a group of scientists on our board who review those. Um, we try to get back to people within 72 hours, so about three days. Um, and then what happens there is not a pass or fail, but that starts a conversation. So most often what we see is our teenagers um, have problems with safety. They do not understand what reagents or organisms or even protocol design are safe. And they come to us with something and we have to go back and say, that's great. We're really excited by your enthusiasm. Now here's all the reasons you can't do this experiment here, but here's some suggestions we have for how you could safely do this experiment um, or how you could do a better experimental design. We do have two of our members who are PhD scientists who do lab office hours um, a couple times a month for an hour. And if you're a member, you can get a 10 to 20 minute slot with them to actually get some um, advice on um, experiment design. So primarily the teenagers come in for that. Uh, we do have a lot of kids who do their science fair projects with us because they get access to really good equipment and really good mentors. Um, but we actually have the startup companies who come to those office hours as well. And those office hours are free for the very short slots. Um, but the big thing uh, is that members watch out for each other. So we're very lucky that because we have a lot of startups, that means we do have a lot of scientists who are just hanging out at the lab and no one is shy about correcting each other. If you see somebody using equipment wrong, um, there's only, unlike most maker spaces, we only really have two things that are dangerous in the lab. So if you are thinking about this, the two things you need to worry about are the um, uh, uh, centrifuges. So if you have high speed centrifuges, not just a bench top centrifuge, um, those can be very dangerous. I really discourage anyone under 18 using those, have an adult load it for you or just make sure you understand. Um, and that's just because they have to be loaded carefully. Um, and the autoclave. And the autoclave, like any kind of high pressure, high temperature device, again, it's not really much more dangerous. Well, it's about as the same danger as using an instant pot. A lot of spaces when they're startup actually use an instant pot as an autoclave. It makes a perfectly good autoclave. But again, it's not necessarily the sort of things I let our under 18 members have access to. But in a maker space, those are the only two things that aren't chemicals. So you do need to be careful of chemicals and chemical disposal. Um, the good thing is, is that uh, the global community actually got a grant and spent the last year with a group of about 10 people writing a biosafety manual. So there is an online biosafety manual specifically written for community labs that answers most common questions that is freely accessible to anybody who wants to do this. So if you guys are interested, you should absolutely take advantage of that resource um, that's out there. As far as how we're governed, you know, we're like any space, we have a board of directors, um, members, shared vision statement, all that kind of stuff. This is just some of the companies that have come out of BioCurious. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about startups, which is what more, a lot of other people are interested in, but just to give you an idea of the kind of startups that have come out of there, our biggest success has been Mammoth Bioscience. They were um, using CRISPR gene editing as a way to diagnose things. They started because Trevor Martin was a Stanford PhD. He couldn't get lab time at Stanford. And if he worked at Stanford, Stanford keeps his IP. By leaving Stanford and coming to our lab, he got to keep his IP and very, very quickly um, ramp up this startup. They've raised 70 million in funding for uh, their startup before COVID hit. With COVID, they were able to uh, tweak their diagnostics platform and were one of the seven finalists that is splitting 250 million in NIH funding uh, for new COVID testing platforms. Um, and that has been ruled out and is being used uh, at quite a lot of the hospitals in the Bay Area. So um, we were really excited to be able to support them. They have actually not been at BioCurious for a while. They're very large now. Um, we tend to have companies that are more like two or three people, but once they get bigger than that, they tend to move out. We do wanna talk about why I like having kids or teenagers at the lab. Um, and this is an example of why having access to community 
lab spaces is important. Um, I think that having access for people to explore science is important, but having access for people to really explore things important to them is big. So Elodie was a member who came to us as a 16 year old who was a junior in high school. Um, and she really was interested in um, finding a treatment for her brother's condition. And this is the normal sort of thing where a lot of scientists would have said, go get a PhD and then come back to me. Um, and we worked with her and what her brother's condition is that um, he gets spontaneous uh, pneumothoraces. That means his lungs detach from his chest wall. And the only treatment they've had for him is to crack open his chest use um, the equivalent of sandpaper to create scar tissue on the inside of his chest and then reattach his lungs once the um, scar tissue is formed. He's had this over half a dozen times. And so she spent a lot of time in hospitals and what she was thinking and just reading biology books while she was in hospitals with her brother is this is really barbaric. There should be some sort of treatment for this that doesn't require the scar tissue. And what she was looking for is a biological Velcro or a binding protein. So she worked with one of our mentors, Eric Espinosa, PhD from Stanford, and she, he taught her the lab skills, but she did 100% of the lab work. She would be in the lab from, you know, right after school till 10 p.m. a lot of days. She would be there on the weekends. Um, and over the course of about 18 months, she actually did it. She developed a prototype uh, binding protein that binds to the exact type of tissues she's looking for. It's novel, she's patented her work, she's been featured in Scientific American. Um, she started a startup company, she got into the university of her choice and is working as a freshman in college um, as a laboratory research partner in a university with a, with a um, researcher who, a uh, professor whose specialty is binding proteins, who saw her published work and said, I want to work with you, um, come work in my lab, which never happens to freshmen. So not just for um, the fact that she was able to do something cool and get into the university of her choice, but no one was really gonna look into this problem because it's such a specialized thing. And there are so many problems like that and giving people some of the tools to solve and not necessarily, you know, science is big and this is hard, but at least giving them the fighting chance to get access to understand more and work on things um, and championing them, I think is really important. And there's an entire area of personalized medicine um, uh, that she's a really good example of. Um, obviously, you know, there's the question, are there other community labs out there other than BioCurious? Of course, um, JR mentioned the bio, uh, Global Bio Summit. Um, bio Summit started uh, three, four years ago. The first one had 180 uh, members from uh, community labs across the world. The second one had 300. We just did Virtual Bio Summit 4.0 um, two months ago, and we had just over 650 attendees from over 62 countries. So the answer is yes, community labs are all over the world. How big they are is still a challenge and there's a lot of regulatory challenges in some countries that do not exist in the US. So the only thing holding us back in the US is getting people to do this. Um, to help people learn how to run these community labs, we launched a fellowship program um, through the MIT Media Lab, uh, partnering with the Harvard Business School or a leadership school at the Kennedy School. Um, and the first class, we had 36 fellows from 25 countries. This past year, we did it again, and we had another 36 fellows from, I think, 27 countries. And what we do is we do a summer fellowship teaching people how to be community leaders um, and how to inspire people with science. Um, this is what it looks like in uh, Latin America, a lot of interest um, in community labs from Latin America. Um, Biosummit is great. As I mentioned, the biosafety manual. We've also worked a lot about thinking about community labs as being really unified in a way I don't see. Um, I see the maker spaces are working on as well through Nation of Makers. Um, so we've created shared ethics documents, a shared statement of purpose. Um, we're working on creating uh, an IRB for DIY bio, which is an institutional review board. This would be like an ethics board that if you have an experiment and you have questions, 
is this experiment ethical? Am I doing the right thing? Right now, you don't have a fallback for that. And community labs are small and wouldn't have that. So we're thinking, can we create a group of uh, volunteer bioethicists that can help us frame out what does it look like to have um, some sort of IRB for community labs to fall back on? Um, uh, and we're doing a lot of this um, uh, figuring out how we can govern or create some sort of governance discussion about this global community. Uh, this is the shared statement of purpose and it is one of the longest run on sentences around. Um, the global community's shared statement of purpose is to fundamentally transform life sciences, democratize biotech, to inspire creativity, improve lives by organizing life science change makers and bioenthusiasts to build an inclusive global network, cultivate an accessible commons of knowledge and resources, launch community labs and projects, and enable local educators. Um, so that's great, you know, mission statements are fun. They have a lot of words, but the real question is how do people participate in science? Uh, for us, we actually had a very unusual problem. So we built our community lab in 2011. Um, and we had this great lab. We started out in 2,500 square feet of space. Uh, and no one knew what to do with it. I mean, it sounds kind of funny, but people showed up and they're like, what do I do now? I don't know how to use biology. What am I supposed to do? So at BioCurious, at least, uh, our bedrock and foundation has been community projects. So we're one of the global leaders in building um, uh, community projects that are long-term, sustainable, um, and low-cost uh, projects that are unusual because they are barrier-free science participation. So what that means is our community projects are all sponsored by the lab and they do not require membership to attend or participate in. There is no age barrier. So you can be any age to be there, but if you're under 18, your parent has to be with you. Um, uh, there is no uh, education barrier, again, to keep people from participating in science. Um, and they're long-term research projects that anybody can join in on at any time that run uh, throughout the year. As far as who participates in these projects, this is just a little cross-section of one of them to give you an idea of the breadth of people. So um, just over uh, about 25% of who participates are our high school and middle school students. Because we're Silicon Valley, we do see uh, about another quarter of the participants are engineers, computer scientists, software or hardware engineers. Less than a third or less than a quarter are actual biologists. So um, that's that kind of green color. And these are people who have some sort of biology background. And the blue is our biggest chunk. And that's everybody else. This is lawyers, teachers, architects, venture capitalists, stay at home moms. We've had ballerinas, you name it. I have had people come in um, and participate in science. So what are these projects we do? Uh, this is the most flashy project we are currently running and it's been running since uh, 2016. Open Insulin is about to become its own foundation. And our goal is to find a way to make generic low cost insulin and bring it to patients. So um, we're working to create a biosimilar insulin. Um, we wanna create some sort of patient owned co-op and actually manufacture the insulin. We've been working with groups across the world to do this. Um, we have been covered in the media a lot. So if you ever wanted to discuss um, getting media attention on a project, we're pretty good at that. Um, we've had everything from a six page spread in Time Magazine, a 15 minute documentary on the Wall Street Journal, NPR, et cetera. Um, our goal is nothing short of disrupting the pharma industry and finding a new way to do it through uh, a nonprofit. Um, and really look at the global scope. This is not just a problem in the US. So understand the global context um, and inspire people to think of new ways to do this um, by following the regulatory path for a biosimilar that actually exists. So we plan to do this within um, the realm of working with the FDA. Um, we have Real Vegan Cheese, which has been running since 2014. This is a um, open source project to figure out how to make cheese proteins out of yeast. So this would be a chemically identical to actual cheese. It wouldn't have that kind of weird rubbery taste that vegan cheese has. This would be actual cheese produced without cows. Um, 
uh, for this project, we just take the genome from um, the animal that we want to work with. We put it into yeast. Uh, the yeast make the milk proteins. We make a vegan milk out of that, and you get cheese. Uh, we've been doing this with very little funding. If you want to talk milk science, we're, I'm more than happy to do that um, as to how this works. There's only four proteins we need to do. Um, it's really, really fun. We've been doing this for a long time. Um, again, we've had a lot of science or a lot of media coverage of it. Um, we are trying to make Norwal cheese as a subset of the project because we are weird and we like making science fun and bizarre. Uh, so we do have a whole subset of the project that works on whale um, genomes and looks at how we can make whale cheese because we're not doing it for profit. So we don't have to think, is there a market for this? Do consumers want this? Will venture capitalists pay for that? We can just do science because it's fun. We also are doing this uh, to raise awareness about ocean health, to teach people about genomics. We have an entire subset we did this summer because we were really looking uh, at getting even more silly because we were stressed about the pandemic. And we've been trying to do the phylogeny of unicorns, looking at actually building a, a phylogenetic link, looking at the genomes between um, things like um, the hippopotamus um, and Norwell whales. And where between the two might an actual um, unicorn look like? And what would the unicorn milk protein structure be in theory? So we get very silly on this project, but we do um, actually work on it a lot. The longest running project we've been running is DIY bioprinting. This is a hardware project as well as a lab project. Uh, this is our most participated in project. I've been running this continuously every Thursday since 2012. So if you're at the lab on a Thursday, you'll find me there uh, working on how to figure out how to print with cells. Um, this is just an exploratory work. We try to create open source models. We use plants so that you don't have to have tissue culturing and we want to make it low cost. Most of the participants are high school students. Um, we have a really good time with that. We study cuttlefish. We've been getting um, deep into the genome of sepia bandensis, the dwarf cuttlefish, sequencing it, playing with its genome. We're hoping to develop cell lines from this using CRISPR gene editing to um, study the oncogenes or cancer-causing genes. Um, we have some super ambitious plans. It may not sound like it, but uh, the Cuttlefish Project is the most scientifically ambitious project we are working on. This is definitely a, if we manage to pull this off, which we have not yet, we have a lot of ways to go. But if we did this, this would be like the cover of Science Magazine sort of discovery. So this is like cutting edge, new ways to do things, really, really interesting, innovative research um, that I have third graders participating in. So I have one of my students, she's a third grader. She's no, she was a third grader, she's now fourth grader. Um, and she can do a lot of the science and she understands and her and her sister who's a ninth grader come to every meeting. They're absolutely fantastic. And it's been great to see um, the kids as well as the PhDs get excited about this. We study kombucha. Um, this is kind of food science to get the general public interested. Again, we're looking at the genome of kombucha. Uh, and I consider this kind of like bioinformatics 101. Kombucha has very short genomes for the bacteria and yeast. Um, so unlike the cuttlefish project, which can be very complex and very, very advanced to jump into, we started this project as kind of like the opposite. This one's really easy. Um, and people like knowing about their food and learning about kombucha. Um, and last, uh, this summer, we started COVID chat. So in February, we started this uh, and we do a 90 minute chat every Saturday. We do a science uh, roundup of all the head top science stories only, no uh, politics. Um, we actually uh, spend the last 30 minutes um, after we do a science roundup and we've been working on an open source uh, project to figure out how to use some, um, raspberry pies and some very simple um, uh, sensors to figure out how effective homemade masks are. So this would be a particle counter. They would actually let you take a mask that you have at home and say, I bought this mask at Old Navy or off Etsy. How good is it? Um, and our goal with this is to put the uh, build materials online and have other maker spaces and other community labs building these and letting people get a really good idea how to do this. Um, so uh, that 
is what community science can be. Um, so now we can open it up to questions. You can um, screenshot ways to get in touch with me uh, and I will share my slides. So if anybody wants to get a copy of the deck. Great, thanks. So uh, we can take a couple of questions for Maria. Uh, we are going to, we have some other uh, steps or speakers. So I, I'll limit the questions somewhat, but if there's uh, some comments or questions, we can entertain them. So um, I actually have a, a few questions. I'll ask most of them offline to, through chat, but um, I want to ask one very directly because of how it impacts the world stage. I'm wondering, Maria, Oh, apologies. My name is Jay, by the way. Um, I'm wondering, with the global democratization that you're focused on, if there are any uh, charter instruments that you have within your charter to separate uh, the agenda of your organization to keep you guys separate from any nation state uh, agendas or policies uh, that may want to steer or uh, bind your organization and your goals to weaponizing or uh, depleting resources from other nations, et cetera? So uh, not so much. I think the big thing, and this actually comes up a lot just for background. Um, other things that I get involved in a lot are, um, I'm involved in a lot of bioethics discussions. So I mean, national policy making bioethics discussions. I'm a frequent speaker at bio uh, security conferences. So this is something I do talk about a lot and work with the biosecurity community, both in the FBI or national homeland security or other groups to talk about. Um, primarily, they are not concerned about that, at least in the US. Uh, community labs actually make community safer because a lot of people would try to do these experiments outside of a lab, having them in a lab gives them some measure of oversight and somebody watching security. As far as nation states, um, they aren't concerned about community labs uh, doing anything. The volume of what it would take to weaponize anything is very, very difficult in science. I, I um, apologize. I yeah, but, I, but there's, a couple of, there, there's a couple of levels of questions here, but if you wanna follow up offline, there's a lot of different things uh, of nuance to that question you can get into. That'd be great. Yeah. Great, did anyone else have a, a question? We'll take one or two more. Yeah, um, so Jay, I just, uh, Maria, what a great, great presentation. Thank you for that. Um, just really um, exciting. I, I'm a scientist myself, so it's really cool to see this uh, getting spread through the community. Uh, you, you talked about those community projects or, or uh, programs that um, anybody, even if they're not members, can participate. How do you come up with those ideas um, and who leads them? Uh, so uh, the, the good slash bad news is I co-lead all of them, which is not the situation I want, but um, I actually have a little document for how we vet community projects. Um, a community project for me has to have a minimum of two to three people who will stick with it for the life of the project, hopefully one of which will be a scientist. That is very helpful. It's not always the case. We didn't have any scientists on open insulin when we started. We actually didn't get anybody who knew anything about insulin for about a year. We just thought we'd do it because we thought it was important. We had some diabetics who were like, this is ridiculous. I can't afford my insulin. Maybe we should be making it. Um, but I think the big thing for me is you need people who will stick with them and who understand um, science communication and that community projects can have one of two goals. One is to be um, end product, like we are trying to solve or create something or they can be exploratory. Uh, Bioprinting is very exploratory. We're very just exploring the field. We're creating things, we're doing lab work, we're making bioprinters. Um, you know, open insulin where we have an end goal and it's now become a foundation or it's, right. we're, we're incorporating to become a foundation. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just takes somebody who says, I want to do this and this is what I'm interested in. It can be anything. I mean, we've had people, we've had probably 15 community projects since I've been there. Fantastic. Thank, thank you so much. And I think you're a superwoman. Thank you. One more question if folks have it, and then next we'll move on to the actual video tour of the space at Makehaven, which I'm sure you're all interested to, to see. 
Uh, so one last question, if there is one. Yeah. If not, I hope you guys do get a community lab. I mean, um, I love community-based science. I think that, that we have a real problem right now with access to science and the divides between science and the general public and giving people access to explore even the basics of biology, whether it's a microscope or being able to explore DNA a little bit um, is really, really, really important for our society. Um, the last thing I would mention is that I bet most people don't realize that one of the UN listed uh, fundamental human rights is the right to do science. So everyone should have the right to explore science and people think right now in their heads that science is just for PhDs and it shouldn't be. Science should be for everybody. Very good, agreed. Well, uh, Nora, I think you wanna introduce yourself and Nora's gonna show us what we have set up as our uh, community bio lab. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Nora, I'm a, the volunteer facilitator the bio lab um, and I got my PhD last year studying uh, new forms of CRISPR and bacteria and then this year I started my postdoctoral position um, at Yale and here I'm studying uh, the microbiome just like the good bacteria I like to say um, and I'm really excited about the lab uh, especially because we were just looking over our uh, microbiology kit here. Um, we're ready to start um, a little class on making agar art. And then we've got um, the Petri dishes and some of our glassware. Um, we're starting to get set up to do molecular biology, um, like with all our pipettes and our nano drop, which is a fluorospectrometer, which is just a way to measure um, whether you, the amounts of a chemical and a liquid. Um, and then we've got this vintage microscope. Um, it's really fun to play around with. And um, here is an incubator. So this, this is kept at 30 degrees, which oh, maybe a little cooler. We've got the kombucha growing in, Maria had mentioned. Um, and then, We've also got our brewery station right here. Um, and yeah, I was really excited to hear all, the, all that you had to say, Maria, especially um, my background in microbiology. And I think there is obviously a lot of potential in uh, cuttlefish and in looking at stuff in the, you know, in the environment, but there is, there's so much that we can do with molecular biology and microbiology and just getting people engaged. Um, so yeah, happy to take any questions or talk more about the projects. Yeah, were there any questions about the, the space that we have set up there? How, uh, how do you intend to publicize what cool stuff is going on I found as a, a member of Make Haven that being around the excitement helps create my excitement. So I'm, I'm wondering what, what might be a part of the process to help promote what's going on there. So that way, uh, those who are maybe not around or unawares can get excited about it. Yeah, so I think at this stage, the first thing we're gonna do is some events which are uh, going to inspire and be exciting. So we'll be promoting those events and uh, teaching people about interesting things. One of the things that we see at Make Haven is word of mouth is really powerful. So I'm hoping that those experience will build on them. Uh, I can actually show you a few of the uh, events if you are interested in seeing. Um, so here, um, if you're seeing my screen, mm -hmm. there's a, we already talked about drawing in a Petri dish. So this is an example. I drew like a little make haven robot using bacteria. There's a kombucha leather, which you've already heard about. Uh, shaping things with mycelium. And uh, in a moment, I think we might hear from uh, Thad, who's at the, uh, the group that works on microbiology or um, mushrooms and ethnobiology and so on at Yale. 
Um, microfluidics is something that some uh, places have done, or at least teaching the concepts of them. Um, mushroom logs, that this sort of gets into the community garden outside. There's a variety of biomaterials, which we can do. Uh, of course, there's the home brewing system, which is all automated. And then things like uh, DNA fingerprinting. So actually using uh, something like CRISPR to break up the DNA and then using a uh, electrophoresis chamber, which is essentially creates a negative, uh, creates a charge and the DNA is pulled through a medium and you can get a fingerprint, um, which to me feels like really exciting uh, science to be able to, to have and to truly identify, say, the fish you buy at the grocery store, if it's the species you were intending. So those are just a few of the uh, concepts, and there'll be more as we borrow from other places. But I think events are one of the primary ways that will be getting people excited. Awesome. Thank you, JR. Uh, other questions for Nora? Nora, for what it's worth, I am so full of questions, but I'm so ignorant about the subject, I don't even know what to ask. So my questions are uh, they're pending. I look forward to speaking with you. Great. Well, uh, if there aren't any questions right now, we'll, we'll have a moment. I think what we're gonna do is I'm gonna jump over to Usha, who's gonna talk about the larger ecosystem with bio in Connecticut and, and how those resources are there locally. Uh, then we're gonna go to around the room, uh, do some introductions so we all know who is, is here and we'll have a more like open, open discussion. So uh, Usha. Um, hey, can you... Um... Can you let me share the screen? Yes. It's funny, it's not letting, I think I have to make you host so you can share. So I'm gonna do that and then I'll take it back. Okay. <laughs> uh, one moment. You should be able to share now. I am. Okay, I hope you can um, see my, my screen. Um, we can. Oh, I'm sharing the wrong one. Sorry. Oh, I might have to. No, no, no. That's not. It's because of me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Let me let me just um, find the right slide. That was my fault. Yeah, I did a, a talk on um, COVID, so that's that's why that slide was up there. So what I thought I would do is, um, you know, uh, I was inspired by what Maria presented, and um, I, I think there's just so much that um, the bio community in New Haven could benefit from. So um, JR asked me to think about uh, providing all the resources that we have at our fingertip. And I kind of thought about, you know, this is not an exclusive, li uh, exhaustive list, but um, if you have an idea um, and regardless of what that idea is, it's always great to have that bounced off with uh, mentors and or go to the uh, New Haven Free Public Library and take a look at that, look at information uh, as you heard Maria saying that nobody there knew about insulin and what, anything about the insulin research itself, but yet you're able to run with it. So there's a tremendous power in going to the library. And then I wanted to uh, focus on the fact that we have now a community biospace as JR and Nora walked us through what resources are already available. Uh, as, a, as a scientist myself, I can tell you this is invaluable resources that we have, which is very affordable, some of the key points that Maria made, um, affordable and accessible. It is the only way we can get the community to get excited about bio. There is just so much that we can do. We don't need to have the most expensive equipment um, to do those kinds of science. So I'm, I'm thrilled that JR has uh, created this space. And I know JR, you've been talking about this for about two, three years now, and it's uh, great to see it come to fruition. So that's our uh, immediate space within New Haven that we have these resources, but 
beyond that, if you think about um, the fact that you have resources on the internet, um, there are colleges. We have Southern Connecticut College, um, Al uh, Alberts, uh, Albertus, uh, um, uh, blanking on the name here, but Yale University. Um, there's also the New Haven Innovation um, Collaborative, which is a, a uh, innovation place, one of the four innovation places that the state has. And this is one of the places where you can get some funding and it may be small amount of funding uh, to start a project where you have some creative ideas and you have some data that says this is worthwhile moving forward. So it's, it's a place to look for that. The New Haven Science Fair is another area. And I would encourage you, even, even if you are not um, presenting there or have a project there, go attend them. And um, uh, another thing that Maria mentioned where um, having students come in and do their projects at the community uh, site. I think that's fantastic. One thing that I didn't put here, but something that again, Maria inspired me to think about, uh, we do have a lot of startup companies um, starting from typically Yale and they need space, but they can't afford it. It's, it's quite expensive to have any of those spaces available for you. Secondly, we don't have any space. They're all occupied. I have a list of 14 startups waiting for space. So this is a prime location for even startups to go in and experiment. The other pieces that are much more a broader aspect uh, are, you know, when you think about the food incubators, and uh, again, that is all science, and how do we cultivate new proteins? You saw Maria's presentation talking about how the protein chemistry for food has evolved over time, and our dependence, and it, it's also um, a more from a environmental friendly perspective as well. So there are science that we can do that. Um, a brewery, um, uh, when you think about agriculture, so there's, the list is endless. And we do have food incubators in the state. We will have one in New Haven soon. Uh, the other resources that I thought might be of interest to you is Biopath. This is a Southern Connecticut State University. They have internship program for our college kids. Our local companies um, hire them to come in for summer. Some of them keep them for the entire year. BioCT is the association that is a nonprofit association that um, ties all of the companies together and, and helps with policy, but also other aspects of resources that companies, our companies need. We have CT Next, which is a quasi state uh, entity that sort of funds the New Haven Innovation Collaborative. They are, uh, they are one of the major funders. But there's also other funds and grants that they offer for com uh, competition and for, uh, for ideas that you have. Um, and that pitch happens twice a year, sometimes four times a year. Uh, at the state level, there is also the Connecticut Science and Engineering Fair. It's highly competitive to get into that. Um, but again, a great place to network the connections you make with the scientists. And as a scientist, I can tell you that we love, we, we're geeky, we love these kinds of stuff. We love to talk about it. Um, Connecticut Innovations is um, again, a quasi state entity that is the investor. They have money that they invest. Now these, we are talking about pretty significant dollars but when your idea gets to a certain point and if you need money, you can go there. One caveat there, and again, connecting back to something Maria said, um, CI would not invest in a company unless they thought that it was going to make profit. So it's a for-profit perspective, uh, but I think the social, uh, uh, so, social wellness and our community's wellness uh, trumps everything else. So we should be thinking about how to position it as to the value of what we are doing here. And then we have the regular investors as well. So. Uh, just a big picture of the various resources that are available within the state, uh, but also locally. So I'll pause there. Um, I also have the next slide that just kind of gives you, if you're interested, um, there is resource, the, there's references, a lot of information on the internet. Um, so I'm happy to send these slides over and um, that way you can, you can look at those references as well. Happy to chat. Uh, take any questions. I work in New Haven on, uh, with the EDC as a biostrategist. As I said, I'm a uh, 
scientist myself, worked for many years, uh, but now I help and enable young startup companies. Great. Well, thank you, Usha, for that perspective. And there are, I think the, one of the important points to me looking at this diagram is that you can start something and then as you increase your, the scope or your project grows, that there are different levels of resources all the way up to, the, uh, to investors and helping you connect to, to investors. Yep, and that's exactly what I was trying to show in here. You don't have to go all the way big. You can start small. Yes, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we will, um, I'm going to hold questions for you until we get to the other, uh, to the next part. We'll do a bunch of questions. I wanted to give, uh, is Theo from Yale YEMS uh, here? I just thought we're talking about partnerships and, and growth, and we had recently talked about a partnership, so he might want to just say a thing or two. Sure, yeah. Uh, so and my name is Theo, yeah. and uh, I'm very excited about this. I'm one of the co-leaders of the Yale Ethnobotany and Mycology Society called YEMS for short. Um, it's a student-led group that has um, for uh, quite a few years now been um, putting on events for the community and also inviting speakers to come uh, through and kind of share information. We've had both uh, professional ethnobotanists um, and more um, say herbalists and mycologists. Um, so people kind of straddling uh, traditional science and traditional um, knowledge sharing. Uh, and it's been amazing to have so many people come through and also so many people who want to do hands-on things um, so we've led a lot of different workshops in the past, some of which have been very popular, um, especially uh, yearly or semesterly mushroom inoculation workshop where we get uh, logs and actually show people how they would go through inoculating them. Uh, and recently we got into contact with JR um, and we have this mutual interest in exploring uh, mycotexture, myco molding, um, and the Makehaven space seems perfect for that. Um, granted, we have the complications of the pandemic, but uh, in recent meetings, the idea of leading sort of a cooking show style uh, molding workshop seems like a great way to kick things off. Um, TBD, what exactly we will be molding. Um, I was thinking maybe like a, a planter so that people can uh, then turn around and have a nice little <laughs> home plant or something like that. But um, I think even not knowing what exactly we're going to do, I mean, we will decide that, but I like the idea of this being something where there's iteration and feedback from the community, um, you know, taking requests, that sort of thing. Um, so we're, we're really excited about it. Great. Well, thank you. I'm excited about it too. And it, uh to have the mushrooms uh, roots or mycelium make different shapes gives us you know, interesting options for sustainable and unique uh, application of materials. So what I wanna do now is, uh, you know, we did lose a few people, but for the people that are here, uh, just to go around and uh, say your name and uh, you know, in one breath, uh, why you are interested in this or why you're here, or your, your relationship to bio. So, um, why don't we go, uh, Aaron? Hi, uh, so my name is Aaron. I am uh, relatively new to bio. I was that kid that um, really just like wanted more to have fun and never really like, got into the actual learning part. Uh, but I had a phenomenal biology teacher in high school. Uh, and gosh, was I wasted on him. Um, but, you know, I, I think now it's this community is an amazing thing. I, I could walk in, see some people doing something, ask some questions and find myself thinking about it hours later and wondering what that might be like. So I'm I'm here to state my curiosity and I'm here to, to know what cool stuff is going on uh, and I'm here to be inspired. We'll see. We'll see what happens next. Great. Uh, Brenda? 
Hi, I'm Brenda Brown, and I'm Make Haven's facilitator for radio and outreach. Right now, I'm virtual only. Um, but as part of my outreach, I publicize all of Make Haven's events, including this one on five social media sites. And I try to attend all the events that interest me, which is like most of them. So here I am. Thanks. Steve? So I'm a, a freelance writer and documentary filmmaker. I live in the Worcester Square neighborhood. And um, I do write uh, with some frequency for Yale Medicine Magazine. So I have a lot of interest in biotechnology. And I also was a technology journalist for many years at, at Business Week and other places. And I was in Silicon Valley. So I'm very interested in the startup culture and right now, one of the things I'm focusing on is just the idea of creating organizations that are innovative and are aimed at um, kind of mission-based and aimed at solving problems and creating economic activity without uh, aiming to make profits. So I like this. Great, thank you. Uh, Jay? Hi, Jay Johnson, uh, Education and Outreach. I'm actually very interested in sustainment of ourselves as organisms without destroying the ecosystem, uh, while also preserving uh, balance and equity across the whole uh, and trying to assure that there's oversight to prevent uh, perversion of greed from uh, destroying that same ecosystem from one portion to the other, uh, so to speak. So I'll leave that. Uh, Rich? Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Rich. I'm a retired engineer, and I have a big interest in the effects of certain wavelengths of light on cellular tissues. Like uh, there's a certain wavelength that supposedly increases the mitochondria's ability to uh, generate ATP. And I would love to, if there's any way that we can mess around with that in the lab, that's very interesting to me. And today, I'm mispronouncing the name. No, that's correct. It's Sidi. Hi. Um, so I'm a postdoc at Yale. Um, I'm currently I'm currently working on intestinal biology and studying how the intestine develops. But I'm looking to move into the synthetic biology field. Um, last year I was in New York and I was hanging out in the gen space in like the DIY bio makerspace community, which was gen space and biotech without borders. And um, I realized that I wanna be able to find the time like after hours to like work on my side project and, but also, you know, um, work with people of different, with different expertise, not only just to like make something that might be useful, but also to do something like bio art. So I was actually told about this particular event by my friend Ada, who comes to Make Haven pretty regularly and was like, hey, you gotta go check this out. So I'm really like glad I'm here. Thank you. Um, Marianne. Maybe if Marianne uh, might be not unmuted, Elvira. No, Elvira. Bob. Yeah, hi. I'm I'm Bob. Uh, I'm a facilitator at Make Haven in uh, screen printing and vinyl cutting, and uh, I just logged in because I uh, was curious to see what was developing in in the in that in the room of the biospace. Haven't done much biology since uh, the prior century in high school and college, uh, raising uh, fruit flies for uh, genetic studies. So this is very interesting. Great, well, it's nice to have uh, know who's in the room and uh, to have met all of you. And this kind of takes us to our last formal part of the program. And that's just to discuss our brainstorm. Uh, so my first question really is, 
what are the things you've heard that are most exciting or actionable that people want to take on? Uh, and then as we think about that, we think about what uh, partnerships we want to develop in the community to make those happen. So uh, to anyone who has a inspired activity or, or is just excited by what they saw. I have a quick question. Um, I forgot, I think it was Bob. Uh, Bob, you mentioned fruit flies. Are there gonna, is there any uh, thought to being able to experiment with fruit flies in at Makehaven? We have not yet uh, had that question or consideration. So I'll be talking to folks like uh, Maria and the rest of the community as those questions come up. Our focus at the beginning is going to be getting comfortable with these, um, uh, with those events and activities that I described and we'll, uh, we'll expand out from there. So I don't have an answer. Go for it, Steve. Yeah, I would just, you know, I was so inspired by Maria and her organization. And I would just urge this group to think about including high school students from New Haven in every possible way as interns in every project. Uh, because I think the, the divide in our society and the divide in, in New Haven is huge and it's, it's getting wider and we have to make sure, we have to try to bridge it in every way that's possible. Steve, I, I couldn't agree more. It's just such a huge need. Um, I think the, the access is what we can bridge, right? So once they have access, um, the opportunity for growth and learning is there for everyone then. I would, I would say, you know, anybody doing teen programs, challenge the teens more. My kids hate this, but um, I think we underestimate our teens and they can be doing so much more than what we do with them in school. And we um, don't give them enough responsibility or ability to really be participating in scientists as equals. You know, we treat kids very much like, here's what you're going to learn. Here's where the answers are. Instead of here, learn alongside me or learn with me. Um, and be able to explore science and make mistakes. But uh, also, you know, go out, try things safely, safely try things. The, the other thing I, I think in this sort of dovetails with both Maria and, and Steve's comments, um, we are very fortunate to have a lot of companies in the, in the very, very small uh, concentric circle there. I think we should, we should um, get a few of them to come and be part of this and mentor and volunteer because they, they love doing this. I know this firsthand. I have not met a scientist who does not like to work with others. Um, it's a question of how much time commitment, but I think we can work with that to figure out how to get them to come in and participate as and when they're able. On that topic, do you know Craig Cruz? Yes. Okay. I think he'd be a wonderful person to do that, but like, <laughs> I, he has so many companies and so many lab projects. I don't know. He'd be good. <laughs> but there are others in his lab who would, you know. Yeah. Something that just popped into my head that I think would be kind of interesting is, so I, my, my background is in statistics. Um, I work in, in, in AI and data science for a living. And I think like uh, perhaps doing something on the scientific method, but applied, right? And then being able to explore it in a lot of different spaces, like it's the foundation of a lot of science, but it's applicable in so many different places. I think it might be an interesting sort of way to make connections there or uh, a way to to help uh, broaden the accessibility of it since that process is so valuable in so many different places. But that's just, you know, kind of out there, I guess, not terribly grounded, but I think that might be interesting. I agree, Aaron. Um, I'm Kate. I'm the operations manager at Makehaven. Um, and I, I think some scientific method stuff would be cool. Um, another thing that I would love to see um, as Nora was walking through the space there, 
and kind of um, giving us a, a quick run through of all, all of the different equipment and things like that. I think it would be really fun, um, perhaps with video during the pandemic and then perhaps in the future in, in person to have just sort of like a little feature on each of those tools. So as we're, we're seeing one of these pieces of equipment, just to say like, here, this is what this is and here's what it looks like in action and here's some things you can do with it to kind of feature each of the tools may help um, break down some of the the intimidation factor of the space, um, you know, for, you know, for anyone who really doesn't have a background, but is, is curious about developing some. So any other uh, thoughts on uh, partnerships or connections, or if people have uh, questions for Usha, we sort of jumped through her, her questions, certainly uh, this would be the time. One thing that I'll just mention briefly is um, consideration of partnership opportunities with um, local businesses and uh, commercial establishments, particularly around like waste stream streamlining, um, something that I've been interested in a bit of a white whale for me is um, crustacean derived bioplastic um, and that's something where you can so easily tap into a network of local businesses that just throw away all of the residua of shrimp, lobsters, et cetera, which, you know, some of these things have a cultural significance in Connecticut. And I think that it's um, something that could just percolate in communities, interestingly, around the state, say, and um, I would personally love to do more large scale bioplastic experimentation with crustacean waste. What a great idea. Love it. JR, um, another thought, um, especially during the COVID time, um, I, I am personally, I think I talked to you about this. I'm personally inspired by biomimicry. And um, wonder if there could be sort of events that show a little bit of uh, some of those biomimicry and how that that enables us to come up with new ideas and concepts and and give homework to folks to go back and look in your environment look around you look at the nature and see what inspires you what ideas do you think could be applied for um for our betterment for the the community's betterment um so that's just a thought because I, I'd love to be part of that, just to hear how people think about um, biomimicry. Yeah, well, that aligns well with many of the activities we've done around like, innovation and trying to go through processes that open your mind to what's possible. And uh, nature's run a lot of iterations on a lot of problems so that we can uh, certainly be inspired and, and reapply. So that's a good... Uh, innovation and ideation sort of activity. I have a quick question. Uh, do any of you folks know how to grow yogurt? And would that be uh, the lab be a good place to uh, get a homegrown yogurt kit going in our refrigerators or on our kitchen counters? Anyway, just a thought. Yeah, so we'll have a separation between, so I think of the initiative as all of the types of activities. So that would most likely be done in the kitchen proper uh, rather than the lab area, which won't have, uh, we won't be eating out of it. But uh, it's certainly that is in line uh, with what we're trying to do. And it gets to understanding how you culture something and making yogurt is uh, very easily an activity I could put on that list of activities that we would do. I make yogurt on a regular basis. I want you to tell us how to do it at some time. <laughs> oh, I'm happy to. I, it's just awesome. <laughs> Sign me up. I'm down. I, I have an instant pot, right? Isn't that isn't that all you need to make yogurt? I, I use on the brochure. So I use instant pot here because the temperature is un, unpredictable. We are so it's so cold, so it's just. Um, reliable to use something, but you don't have to have instant pot. You just have to have a warm place. Okay. I, I don't know what instant pot is, but can't you, can't you do it in like a, um, uh, one of those crock pots with 
the temperature yeah. regulation? Yep, absolutely. A small circuit to keep the temperature right, right? Yes, absolutely. So we it. do have an Instapot in the Make Haven kitchen, Rich. So what is an Instapot? When you can get back there. It's, it's a vessel that you can regulate temperature. So it's, oh, it's okay, right. good. Hey, and by the way, Kate, um, I'm expecting to be vaccinated very soon, hopefully within a few days. Okay. Great. Um, Maria, did you have something that you were- I was just going to say, I mean, this is exactly what you guys should be doing. You guys should be saying, I want to learn about X, but how do I do it? Like if you do a yogurt class, just don't just talk about it from like a cooking perspective. What is the history of fermented foods and why are they important? And what do the different strains mean? And, you know, what are the, um, uh, you know, different things you can riff off of that include things like the microbiome, probiotics versus prebiotics the lies of packaging and what it all means, the hype like around these things and overhype. There's so many areas you can take these and it all starts with just somebody saying either, I want to talk about this, let's just sit around and do this. And, and it doesn't have to be formal lab lecture classes. Something like this really informal of just some people wanting to have fun with science and learn from each other is why makerspaces are successful. So it's like, make it makerspaces just with more science. A series called Get Some Culture. <laughs> oh, I love that. I might steal that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we did a great class on um, uh, uh, DNA fingerprinting using having people bring in samples from home of fermented foods they had. People brought in kimchi, kombucha, they brought in uh, yogurt starters, etc. And we sent them out for sequencing for part of the lab fee covered that. And then they got to learn both how to do the DNA extraction what the sequences was, you know, that was, that's a pretty simple class. And um, my big advice to you guys is just take these ideas and see where you can run with them. That's what we do. Are there any animal cell cultures that we can get our hands on to experiment with? So animal cell cultures are a little bit more difficult. Um, so we do have a BioCurious and a tissue culture lab for working with animal cell cultures. Um, the way you guys are set up right now, I would say that you're not set up for tissue culturing because it does need its own room. Um, it can be done as BSL-1, but there's not very many lab strains of tissue cultures that are BSL-1, but there are some. So we have um, most of the BSL-1 lab strains at BioCurious and we sell them to members. So they must purchase them from us. The reason being that a lot of um, cell cultures, uh, mammalian strains were, um, the immortal cell lines and other cell lines were made with a virus. And so there's extra viral stuff that you just don't want people working with. There's a lot of costs uh, associated with it. So it can be done, but you need a dedicated room, somebody who knows how to manage a tissue culture room, or I would not advise starting there. <laughs> There's a whole other areas of biology you can have fun with, but tissue culturing is um, frustrating, expensive. Um, we added it on because we do have that expertise in-house now. Um, and the startup co companies, mo uh, no, we're split between the startups and the high schoolers using it. But they all have to take training um, special for that. So we and stay in the vegetable world, right? Yeah. You stay, in the veg you stay in vegetables, bacteria, yeast. That gives you a lot. You can play with nematodes. Nematode, I mean, it'll, it'll be up to your safety board, but nematodes, you know, little worms are pretty safe. Fruit flies. <laughs> Great. Were there, it seems like uh, we're coming to a, a good point in the discussion, but uh, I wanted to leave it open if there's any final questions that people have been holding back on. Uh, feel free to ask or comments. Uh, feel free to bring them forward now. Um, I have a, a question. JR may already know this, but um, since we've got Usha and Maria and, and others on, on right now, is there a good source, you know, for these kinds of projects and resources, like in the way there's like Thingiverse and Instructables and, you know, like those kinds of things that you can, that you can go to that's sort of like an open source uh, starting point for, for people who are new to this? Uh we're building one like the global community is going to be starting that's one of our projects for this next year is um yes and no uh there's a lot of uh global source for how to use like do lab technique so there's tons of basic lab books out there there's um 
uh, the Journal of Visual Experiments, uh, Jove. So Jove is like a video repository for lab techniques. So it's people showing you how to do common lab things. So if you're like, hey, I forgot how to pipette. I forgot how to pour a plate. I forgot how to do some weird thing. Some postdoc has filmed themselves and put it on Jove. Um, but there is a lot out there. It is a little bit harder to say, is there a get starting guide for DIY bio? No, because there's just like, what topic do you want to get started in? Do you want to get started in bioinformatics? In, um, basic microbiology, et cetera. And then yes, if you can narrow it down some, there's a ton online. And then just to add to what Maria said, um, the slides I, I will send, there are some sites that give you um, projects that you can take on. It doesn't do the um, instructional about how to work in the laboratory, but it gives you project ideas and what you will need for it. So that's in the, in the deck that um, I'll send to, uh, JR already has it. So. So to give you an idea of the next steps, uh, we now have this room established with the equipment and we have Nora as a volunteer and a resource for folks to get started and to learn. We're gonna be brainstorming some of these events to, to uh, continue to bring them out and, and get people involved, but also looking for how we can support people in safely, ethically uh, and productively uh, moving forward on community or individual projects. And this is something we're gonna, we're gonna start slow and, and carefully uh, because it is new to us, but uh, fortunately we have the crutch of others who are doing the same and we'll be looking to uh, people around us as resources. So in, in that uh, spirit, thank you so much to uh, Maria and Usha, to Nora, uh, to all those who have who've spoken today and have uh, agreed to partner, uh, Theo and others we will partner with in the future. Uh, so if you're a Makehaven member, um, soon there'll be a online quiz and we'll work on a video which will make you an official, uh, officially be able to access it. And we'll have the same as with others, we'll have equipment um, checkouts so that you can use uh, particular pieces of equipment. Um, I wish this, so this is a celebration of an opening. I wish this was something we could do in person uh, and that we could provide you uh, pizzas and, and drinks. I, once we are in a place where that is an acceptable and wise thing to do again, uh, we might just have to do a uh, in-person launch or something uh, because it is, there's, there is something nice about seeing things in person and uh, shaking hands and interacting. And I look forward to when we can, we can do that. But in the meantime, I really appreciate all of you taking yet another Zoom uh, meeting call in order to understand what's happening, uh, to share your perspective and to start to build those connections, which will ultimately be uh, something, something new for Makehaven in our community uh, related to empowering people in bio. So, Thank you and uh, happy to have all had you all here. Thank you, JR, and thank you, Maria and Theo and Nora. Mm -hmm.